welcome to uh, welcome to faith. Glad you're here. Uh, contrary to uh, some popular belief, I am not Stu, who just changed into a T-shirt. Uh, we're separated. We're separated by about 10 years, and I'll let you find out who's older. Uh, but my name is Jake, and, uh, and I'm so glad you're here and joining us in a full service. If you're uh, new to faith, you haven't been back in a while, if you're watching online, uh, this morning's a little different. Uh, one, it's a little more full in here, uh, and two, uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, everybody from Teeny Tiny all the way to, I believe, Rachel and, and Stu said, uh, those with a little more wisdom, I think is how we worded it. Yeah, and so uh, full, full room, glad you're here, and so you, if you feel like, hey, it's a little different, it's a little different, and that's all right. So this morning, uh, here's what's, here's what's going to happen is uh, we're going we're gonna to pick up uh, sort of where we left off uh, last week. And uh, if you weren't here last week, let me catch you up to speed. Uh, last week, Stu, who just did the baptisms, got to preach. And uh, we did this, uh, this series, kind of intro, two-week, called uh, The Greatest. And we're not talking like, uh, like the greatest as in the GOAT, the greatest of all time. Uh, like you maybe would throw out like Tom Brady's name or Kelly Slater. We're not talking that. What we're talking about is, uh, is the greatest uh, command. And, uh, and Stu, Stu did that. He talked about the first part of that, which is loving God. And he broke down the account uh, of Jesus teaching in a home and, uh, and, and, uh, of, of two women named Mary and Martha. And Mary uh, sat at the feet of Jesus to learn. And Martha uh, was the hostess who cleaned every single corner to make sure everything was perfect. And, uh, and so uh, what we looked at in that is we said, hey, there's, uh, there, there is uh, Mary defaulting to being with Jesus, Martha defaulting uh, to a busyness or a busy day, and we challenged uh, everybody to love God uh, with their whole being. And so Stu actually left us with, with three questions that I've got here. He said this. He said, how will you love God supremely? Then he said, how will your family love God together? And then the third thing he said is, who in a younger generation than yourself will you invest in to impress upon uh, biblical truths? And so he said, that could be in kids men or student men, or that could be a neighbor down the street. And he set it up like this because these services are family service. And he goes, we want family to be able to talk about this together. We want family to be able to think about it together. And so uh, we're going to talk about the second half of that command today, and here's how I, uh, I want to do that. I want to give, uh, give us an opener uh, to, to get us all in the mood for thinking about the greatest, and uh, Stu did uh, kind of just a chaos version of this last week. Uh, that's fine. That's kids, men. In FSM, Faith Student Ministries, we're a little more refined. Uh, yes, and, uh, and how, we do this is, uh, how we do this is we do a thing called pair share, okay? Here's how pair share works is we would ask a question and then the person next to you, uh, you would get to share with. And so this morning, that could be your family that you're with, but here's what we would say. Uh, if, you've got like a, if you've got a solo next to you, invite them in for the pair share. Don't just let them sit there awkwardly because that's just uncomfortable. And if you're online uh, watching, do it with people in your living room, do it in the chat. We could do it that way as well. Uh, but we're just going to play a similar version of what Stu played last week. Okay, you ready for this? Okay, so just to get you in the mood thinking about the greatest, he did this one last week, the greatest flavor of ice cream. Now share that with a neighbor just real fast, the greatest flavor of ice cream. Good, good. All right. Feel like we got it? Feel like we got it? Okay. Now, in mine, in mine, uh, just, just because I don't want to ask everybody, I'll share mine. Uh, there's one right answer. Uh, there's an ice cream manufacturer by the name of Tillamook, and they make a chocolate peanut butter that is the best. Yeah, that's just the best. Okay, good. And uh, here's the other thing that I forgot. In student ministries, uh, thanks, to, uh, thanks to Brian, who served in student ministries for years, uh, we do this other thing where when we, when we chat a little bit, then we say, amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. And everybody goes, hush, for approximately 3.24 seconds. And then we all look up front. Make sense? And so we're going to practice that in a moment with the next question. And when you hear, amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd, you will? 
Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Question number two. Question number two is this: uh, the greatest game. Now this is a ca- this is a broad category because I want video game, board game, uh, sport, whatever it is. You get to pick, but you only get to pick one. Share with your neighbor. Five, four, three, two, one. And we say, amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, hey, that worked. Okay. I've never done it in a room this big. That was cool. Okay, here we go. The next one is this. Uh, your fa- the greatest beverage. The greatest beverage of all time. Let's go. There's one right answer. All right. Amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. Let's go. That's my new favorite thing. Okay, uh, Stephen, Stephen, what is the right answer? Hot black church coffee. Hot black church coffee. Wow. Okay. Okay. There we go. Yes, yes. I got to, I, or somewhere else. You know, you don't have, actually, Actually, to, to, uh, uh, to our coffee team, our church coffee's all right. Our church coffee's all right. Yeah, yeah. There's some where they still open Folgers. Not okay. Okay. Uh, the next one, the greatest show. This your movie. The greatest show, movie. You can go stage show if you want. I don't care. No rules. Share it. Here we go. With your neighbor or in the chat if you're online. All right, amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. Woo, let's go. Uh, just because just I have the mic means I'm in charge. So uh, anybody in here, just, they just said something Star Wars. Anybody those people? There we go, good. I learned this week that I have some questions to answer for, for the youngest, one of the youngest hills, so we'll get, we'll get on that. Here we go, last one, just because. Stu took us this direction last week when he asked the greatest NBA player of all time. And, uh, and there's a clear answer. Uh, only one, uh, has, only one uh, Michael Jordan or LeBron James has scored a touchdown. So that, that's Michael Jordan, by the way. And so it makes him the best, I'm sure. That brings me to my question. With the start of football season, who's the greatest NFL quarterback of all time? Go ahead and share, share with the neighbor. And if you're not a football person, just listen. Just listen in. All right, amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. Just so we're clear, uh, where's, uh, we're going to go way back because Montana said something silly this week. Any Dan Marino in the room? Okay. Any Joe Montana in the room? Uh, Nate, you're in here. Any, like, Aaron Rodgers in the room? Is that? No? Okay, Brett Favre. Okay, okay. And then uh, where's the Tom Brady people who know what's real? Let's go. You just know it's true, even if you hate it. Because here's the thing, I just wanted to watch him win more. Even after he beat the Seahawks, I was just like, I just want to know how many rings one person can wear. That's what I want to know. Okay. And so we could debate the greatest all morning long. We did a little bit last week. We did this week. Uh, These kinds of questions aren't new to people. And if you've got a Bible or a Bible app, would you go to Matthew chapter 22? And uh, here's what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 22 the greatest question was asked, even in Jesus' day, to Jesus. And uh, what I find interesting is uh, he, he begins to answer it, and that's what we're going to look at in a minute. But as you're turning, if uh, you've got a paper Bible, Matthew's like in the back quarter, and then we're near the end of it. If you get past guys' names, you, you went way too far. So start, start coming back to Matthew chapter 22. But Stu started us here last week, and, uh, and like I said, in this, in this area, uh, uh, these questions about the greatest is not new. It's been something that's been around for a while. And so let me, uh, let me take you there, verse number 36, and it says this, Teacher, 
which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now, Stu talked about that last week. So if you've got questions, you can go to our website and listen back to it. If you're at home, just pause and go listen now. Why not, right? And, uh, and then we get to this. Check this out. Jesus says, the second is equally important. So there's two greatest. Love your neighbor as yourself. And now here's the other thing that we do in the FSM world, which is going to be a bit dangerous right now, is instead of, instead of me just telling you what love your neighbor as yourself means, I want to get you thinking about it as well. So we're going to do just another momentary pair share. Are you ready for this? And here's your question. It's this. What does neighbor mean? Okay, so share with your neighbor. Pair share, the person next to you. It, it, when we're reading this, what do we think about when we read the word neighbor? Go ahead and share with your neighbor right now. And if you're at home, you can type in the chat and join people online. Hi, everybody, but to you too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. Let's go. Now, here's, uh, here's what I know is you probably all sort of landed in a similar place, and that's good. That's what we would hope for. And here's what I'll just do. Normally in FSM, I would walk all over the place and get off our cameras, and I would get people to share. I'll just summarize a few thoughts I have. And here's what I would say. Uh, scripture, all the way back in Leviticus, where this command comes from, uh, uh, seems to make neighbor bigger than the people who live on your street. Uh, Jesus then, in a, in a different account, in the Gospel of Luke, tells a parable of the Good Samaritan. If you've been in church for a while, you know that parable, right? Essentially, here's how it works. It's a story that Jesus made up to uh, illustrate a bigger idea. And in that story, uh, what happens is somebody gets hurt, and the people you would expect to help just walk right on by. Uh, in fact, they do maybe what some of us do when we go downtown Seattle. They cross the street and they walk around the problem, right? And uh, that's what they do. And then the person that they least expect actually helps, right? And Jesus' example in that, I think, is this. I think his example is that wherever I am is my neighbor, right? Wherever I go, my neighbor is there. Make sense? And so that's what we're thinking about as we talk about loving our neighbor as we do that. And then uh, there's one other thing that I just want to uh, ask you briefly, and that's this question. Now, this question is a little more abstract, so some of our younger thinkers in the room might need a little help, uh, and that's okay. Uh, but this is the abstract question. What is assumed when Jesus defines how to love others with as yourself? So Jesus says you love others as yourself. What is he assuming when he says as yourself? Share that with just a neighbor for, for a minute or so. See if you can get there. Amazingly, a hush fell over the crowd. That's the last one for now. All right, and my, my hope is you started thinking about that question, and that's a really challenging question because here's one of the things that I think about it. When I look at this, I go, this is actually a really important thing to notice. Uh, it assumes that we love ourselves, right? If we love others as we love ourselves, the assumption is we do love ourselves. Uh, and that we, like Philippians 2 talks about, we, we actually look out for our own needs as well as the needs of others. And so it's, it's I love myself and I love others. I look out for my needs and I look out for the needs of others. It's actually okay to have needs. I don't know if you know that. And it's okay to like yourself. That's actually a good thing as well. And so for some of you, this passage might need a little edit. It might need to have, and I think it's contextually acceptable, uh, a second and equally important, love your neighbor as you should love yourself, right? And that would mean for some of you, maybe today's take home point is this. I need to learn to love myself so that I can learn to love others. 
right? That may be what some of you need today. Just that right there is like, actually, I'm good. I can walk out, and I'm going to work on loving me so that I know how to properly love other people. And that's a really, really important thing that Jesus tells us, right? And so now here's what I want to do is a moment ago I mentioned Philippians chapter 2, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of our morning, probably eight or so minutes in there. So if you've got a Bible, turn over to Philippians chapter 2. You'll get past the guys' names, and then you'll get into some, uh, some people names, some city names, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, uh, Ephesians, Philippians. And Philippians is, uh, is, a city, uh, is a letter to a church in a city like Seattle or Tacoma. We might call it today like Seattleites or Tacomans might be the book if we wrote a letter today. Uh, and that's what Philippians is. It's to a church uh, in Philippi. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going we're to take a brief, brief hiatus from talking about loving our neighbor. And we're going to look at the gospel as described by Paul who wrote uh, Philippians. And, uh, and here's what I can tell you is uh, um, I, I used to be a, a bit of a, a, a textbook people pleaser, um, and still still a recovering people pleaser, uh, which means that my needs uh, were uh, were on pause, uh, and I didn't I didn't really pursue them. And then uh, you know the other thing is uh, I'm I, I've I've grown from that, and I've grown from the home I grew up in. Right, I'm different. Why am I different? Because I know the gospel and I know what Jesus did for me. And what what Paul uh, what Paul does in Philippians is he goes. Hey, as you think about what it means to love your neighbor, let me tell you what Jesus did for you first, right? And so he actually explains how to love your neighbor in the context of what Jesus did. And I think that's one of the best things that we can do. And so uh, I want that for you. I want the gospel for you to change who you are so that you can love your neighbor well. Paul wants the gospel in your life so that it can change who you are so you can love your neighbor well. And most importantly, God wants that for you. And so if you've got a Bible, we're actually going to go Philippians chapter 2. We're just going to go down to verse number 5. Okay, verse number 5, and this is what it says in verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Okay, so I want you to know, 1 through 4 gets to verse number 5, and verse number 5 qualifies 1 through 4 by what happens next. So we're going to go back to 1 through 4. Remember verse 5, I promise, and now we're going to look at what the gospel says starting in verse number 6. It says, though he was God, this is Jesus, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as a thing to cling to. Jesus wasn't just a good teacher or a wise person. He's God, and he's a generous God, and the next verse tells us a little bit more about that in verse number seven. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being uh, when he appeared in human form. So God came to us. Jesus is God. God came to us. He didn't cling to status or privilege uh, as God. He didn't wait for us to get things right. Uh, but he didn't wait for us to save ourselves from sin. Uh, instead, uh, he took on his human form and came to us. He's the king who gave up his throne. All right, that's what we read in this one. Verse number eight. So he came in human form. He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Jesus is God. Jesus came to us, and Jesus was God's rescue plan for us. All the way back in Genesis, we see God promise that this was going to happen. And, uh, and here's what we know in this and what this passage is alluding to is this idea that Jesus lived the perfect life uh, that we couldn't live. And then he died a death that we deserved, and then he rose from death, uh, defeating uh, sin and death and inviting us to walk into eternity with him. And that's what the gospel is. And so uh, as, a, as an added bonus, I want to add this. Forgiveness of sin and defeating of sin is not just like, hey, that thing that you did that you said you would never do again, or that thing that you uh, won't try or look at or visit again, that thing that keeps you up at night, Jesus forgives that. It's not just that. The forgiveness of sin includes this idea of go and sin no more. You can walk away from it, right? And I love that passage. That's a bonus part here from that. But we get to walk away from it. Why? Because the Holy Spirit in our lives and the community that's around us. And when we look at this, we get one final picture of who Jesus is. And we see that here at the end in verse 9 through 11. It says, Therefore God elevated him, being Jesus, to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what did we just learn in verses 5 through 11? We got the gospel summarized just like this. Jesus is God. Jesus came to us. 
Jesus was God's rescue plan. Jesus lived, died, and rose again for us, and Jesus is worthy of our life and praise. And what happens in verses one through four that we're gonna take just a couple minutes to look at is they get contextualized by the fact that Jesus is the God who gave up his throne to come to us. What does it mean to love your neighbor? You give things up, right? Jesus is uh, God's rescue plan. What does it mean to love your neighbor? Man, you run to help. Jesus uh, lived and died and rose again for us. What does that mean? Man, we fight to be unified together. That's what that looks like, and we're going to see all of that uh, in in, uh, the first four verses of Philippians, where I want to spend the last couple minutes of our time together. So ready? If you'll go back up, you remember verse 5 said, so do this like you would in the person of Jesus. Here we go, verse number 1. Back to Philippians 2, verse 1. That last part was a blitz. We're going to slow down for this thing because it tells us a little bit about how to love our neighbor. You ready? It says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Man, I love looking at this because it asks us this question. Are you encouraged by your walk with Jesus? Or do we look like our unbelieving neighbors? Are we frustrated and angry? Are we no different? Do we find comfort in Jesus Or do we find comfort in other things, substance and content and possessions and people? It asks the question, do we find fellowship and genuine relationship, or do we just stay surface level because nobody should really know us? And then it asks this final question, are we tender and kind and compassionate, or are we part of the caught up cancel and boycott and spew hate kind of culture? Uh, What are we? Are we tender, kind, and compassionate? That's the goal. And so he points that out to us, and then he says, uh, with that framework in mind, somebody who is encouraged by their walk with Jesus, somebody who understands the gospel that we just learned, somebody who finds comfort in Jesus, somebody who loves to be tender and kind and compassionate, with that framework in mind, verse 2, then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and purpose. And so here's what we see here. The idea is that we uh, seek unity, we love one another, and then we live in that unity and love. See that here? We go, okay, we want to love one another and we want to work together with that one mind and purpose. We want to we wanna make, we want to pursue those things. So what does it mean to love a neighbor? It means that exactly. Seek unity, love one another, and then live in that unity and, uh, and love. And so here's what I want to point out. Seek unity is this. It doesn't mean that we never disagree, especially like as Christians, we'll never disagree. That's not true. Uh, what it means is that we seek unity and understanding. We, we try to find common ground. And in the spaces where we disagree, we have charity for one another. Then it says, love one another. Do we, do we care for one another? Are we kind, compassionate? Are we generous? And then it asks us, do we, do we live out of unity and love? Do we work well together? Do we fight for the common good of human flourishing uh, in this place in the name of Jesus? And then last two verses, Philippians 3 through 4, it says, don't be selfish. It's pretty, pretty easy. Okay, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Remember, Jesus is the king who gave up his throne. Verse 4. Don't look out only for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. Right? That's what we talked about just a few moments ago. And so we look at this. It says these two really simple things. Be selfless and be humble. And I want you to know, I want you to know that humility isn't thinking less of yourself. Oh, people are better than me. Or what? No, humility is just thinking of yourself less often. Right? And, uh, and then selflessness isn't forgetting that you have needs. Uh, but it's doing what verse 4 says. It's going, I know my needs, and I'm looking out for yours too. And so together, we're fighting for our own uh, flourishing in the name of Jesus, right? We're fighting for our own common good uh, in the name of Jesus, and that's a good thing. So we want to go be humble, be selfless, but also, Paul quantifies, that means make sure you know you have needs uh, because that's an important thing as well. So we look at verses 1 through 4, and this is it. He goes, loving your neighbor is, is seeking unity rather than what divides. And by the way, Paul isn't just saying uh, this just for the people who you theologically agree with, right? So we go, okay, we're going to seek the things that bring us together, not the things that pull us apart. He goes, uh, we want you to love one another, and that's an important thing, right? We go, okay, we want to love people the way that we should love ourselves. 
uh, the way that we care for ourselves, I should care for others. We want to live in unity and love, which is knowing those two things exist. And then we go, we're going to pursue walking this out every single day. We're going we're to keep this as our focus over and over and over again. And then I'm going to be selfless. I'm going to look out for your needs. I'm going to set sometimes my wants aside to take care of your needs. Right? That's an important part of that. And then I'm going to be humble. I'm going to lift other people up. I'm going to celebrate the brothers and sisters that are around me. That's what it looks like to love our neighbor. It looks like walking out the gospel that Philippians laid out, right? It goes, we walk as Jesus walked. And so here's what I want to do. It's family service. And so I want to give you a few questions maybe you could discuss tonight around dinner uh, or, or maybe throughout this week. And they're very tiny on the screen. Sorry about that. But here's your two questions, or here's your couple of questions. What words or attributes do you think friends would use to describe you? Kind, compassionate, generous, are those words that would come up about you? Or maybe not, right? Uh, when you think of Jesus, what words, attributes, or phrases come to mind? Are there some similar ones? Because, man, I hope there is. And last two, thinking of the list of things that help us love our neighbor, that list on the last slide, which one is most difficult for you and which one is most natural for you? Right? Some of us go, yeah, I'm, I'm really naturally selfless. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue other people's needs. Like, I can do that so easy. Uh, but then we go, but I don't really love other people because I only do that for the people I like. Okay, we know the answer to that, right? Now we need to work on going, I want to pursue even people outside of the people I like's needs. Last one, what is one thing we could do together or on our own as a family or individually to love our neighbor better this week? So instead of giving you a list of to-dos this week, I'm giving you some questions to discuss as a family so that you can decide what are our to-dos. Let me pray for you and we'll worship together. So if you would, bow your head with me and we'll pray. God, thank you for uh, this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be together and uh, learn together, laugh together, grow together. Now, God, we ask for this, uh, this time of worship to be pleasing to you and a blessing to our life. And this week, God, as we discuss what it looks like to love our neighbor, can you give us some really, really practical options? Lord, we love you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.